This medication costs $3,000. This medication here is an injectable medication. It's a long-acting antipsychotic. It's known as Invega Sustena with the brand name Paliperidone Palmitate. And this is an injection I've given probably, I don't know, maybe 300 times in my nursing career. So if you do the math, we're talking around, I've probably given about a million dollars worth of this medication to my patients. But $3,000 a month. Can you imagine having to pay $3,000 a month just to keep you stable if you were diagnosed with schizophrenia. So I've had some patients actually who were given this medication every three weeks. We had a geriatric patient, I believe, who was given this every 18 days. So imagine every 18 days, $3,000. Of course, I've covered up, this is an injection I gave, the box is empty. I covered up the patient's name, all their information here with some electrical tape. But this injection is very, very expensive. So I would inject it either in the deltoid or in the ventral gluteal area. The syringe is about the yay big. It's not really that big. You shake it up real well, and then you inject it kind of slowly into whatever muscle you choose, and you do it monthly. And of course, patients that are receiving this injection aren't really paying $3,000 out of pocket. All of their medication is covered by Medicaid, so it's tax money that's covering this very expensive injection. So of course there is big business, big money to be made with a pharmaceutical like this, but I'm not here to talk about this medication specifically. What we're here to talk about is how something like this Invega Sustena is marketed. And guys, I have to forewarn you, I am a nerd when it comes to research. I love reading peer-reviewed articles. I love reading how stuff is marketed and then just going back to the article and reading it. So that's what we're gonna do in this video. We're gonna check out exactly how something like this is marketed. All right, so if we go to Google and we type in Invega Sustena, which I obviously cannot spell, we scroll down, we click on Invega Sustena, we land on their beautiful marketing page here. Actually, this is pretty cool if we look at this. This is really neat. I wonder how they did that, some sort of CGI or something. But anyhow, let's say that we're a doctor. We click on efficacy up here and we see pivotal studies. And I'm like, okay, I wanna see the pivotal studies that support this kind of injection. We scroll through here and it just talks amazingly about Invega. And if you want, you can go to the same landing page. You just Google Invega and you can look at all this wonderful data they have to support their own drug. But what we're more interested in is where exactly do they get this information from? Well, they get it from research that they themselves have conducted. So if we go to this page and we hit Control F and we type in references, we'll see that the references for this landing page are all down here. Now, the first thing that I notice is that these studies are funded by Janssen Pharmaceuticals. Here's one from Janssen. Here's another from Janssen. There's five, looks like there's five total research articles. But what I did is I just picked one randomly and I Googled it because it's very difficult for me to understand what exactly is going on without actually looking at the study itself. So the study that we're going to be looking at is this number two one here. It's called Paliperidone Palmitate Maintenance Treatment and Delaying the Time to Relapse in Patients with Schizophrenia. Here's the title of the research paper. It's called Paliperidone Palmitate Maintenance Treatment and Delaying the Time to Relapse in Patients with Schizophrenia, a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study. So maybe read this title again to yourself and see what you think about it. Like what exactly from the title are these researchers trying to find? I'll tell you what I think think when I read this title. So when I read this title, this is what I think. Paliperidone palmitate and vagus astena, maintenance treatment. Maintenance treatment just means, you know, once every few weeks, once every month, and delaying the time to relapse in patients. So what they're going to do is they're going to separate these patients into two groups. One of them's going to get the Invega Sustena, that's the treatment. The other one is going to get the placebo, and then they're going to measure the time that it takes for both groups to relapse. Both groups of people are diagnosed with schizophrenia, and then however they measure relapse, a lot of times relapse is measured by hospitalizations, incarcerations, arrests, whatever. I don't know, I haven't read the study yet, but that's kind of what I'm thinking as I read this title. So they're going to say, okay, which group has, say, more frequent hospitalizations? If it turns out that the Invega Sustena group, this magical group here, has less hospitalizations than the placebo than the placebo group than the placebo group that I cannot talk than the placebo group then we might say hey look and vega sustena is actually efficacious it helps in delaying relapse of patients with schizophrenia all right so then the next part of the title says a randomized double blind placebo controlled study so the first part is randomization so presumably Janssen has this large group of people it's going to split the group up randomly done probably by a computer and then it's going to give the treatment, which is in Vega, to one group and a placebo to the other group. And the double blind part 
refers to this one group here that's receiving the treatment, which is in vagus astena. They are not going to know if they're getting a placebo or they are getting the treatment. Similarly, the group over here that's the placebo group will not know if they are getting the treatment or if they're getting the placebo. Then the next part of the blindedness comes with the researchers who are assessing the two groups. The researchers themselves should not know who's getting the placebo the placebo and who's getting the Invegas Astena. Now I will tell you this, after already reading this title, I already know that there is an issue with the way this study is conducted because after working in mental health for some time, I can assure you that you, you know clearly who's on an antipsychotic medication and who is not. For instance, if I took you and your friend and someone randomized the antipsychotic to you or your friend and a placebo to you or your friend, I can guarantee you the next day I'm gonna know who's taking the antipsychotic, the person who's sleeping all day. So I will already say there's kind of an issue with the way the study was done. Ideally, I think, Maybe a better way would you, you'd have like three groups, right? One group would be the Invegas Astena group, and of course this would be randomized. The other group would be placebo, and then the third group would receive some sort of medication that causes sedation that's similar to the sedation caused by antipsychotics, but you wouldn't want it to mess with dopamine because the antipsychotics mess with dopamine would have to have a different mechanism of action. So maybe you could use a benzodiazepine like Ativan or something like that to cause sedation. So you should have kind of three groups because the issue is, is that when a researcher is a when a, when a blinded researcher is assessing these two groups, hypothetically, they already know who's getting the treatment. The person who's sedated, you can, you, it's very easy to tell who's taking an antipsychotic medication and who's not. So I feel like the double blindness here, although I will give Jansen some respect for the fact that they made it a blinded study, at the same time, I don't know how well that blindness is truly working here. So I'm a little skeptical about that as I'm reading the title. All right, so then we move down to the abstract of this article. We look at the objective. It says, we assessed efficacy and tolerability of the injectable atypical antipsychotic paliperidone palmitate and delaying time to relapse in adults with schizophrenia. It's pretty much what we just talked about. One of my favorite parts about reading research is the method because oftentimes the devil is in the detail. All right, let's look at the method. So eligible patients, eligible patients. All right, positive and negative syndrome scale score total under 120. So PANS, in case you're wondering what PANS is, it's a score that sort of rates the severity of someone's schizophrenia. PANS items are rated on a seven point scale, one being absent, and then if we look down here, it says seven being extreme. So the lower, the, the lower your PANS score, the lesser the severity of your schizophrenia. I'm only mentioning this because when I hear, when I first read this method and it says eligible patients, I'm like, hmm, so some patients aren't eligible, which means we're excluding some. So already there's a limitation to our study. So whatever conclusion this study may draw, it's only going to be valid on those people who are diagnosed with schizophrenia and they have a total PAN score under 120. And I have no experience with PANS whatsoever. So you could tell me like, oh, they only have a PAN score of 60, someone could have a PAN score of 300. All I know is that the 300 person has a more severe form of schizophrenia or a more severe presentation of schizophrenia than the person who has a PAN score of like 60. But I couldn't be like, oh, their PAN score is 300, so therefore they're going to be looking, their behavior is going to look like X, Y, and Z, if that makes sense. So eligible patients were transitioned from previous antipsychotics to paliperidone palmitate during a nine week open label phase. So they took patients who were already on some sort of oral antipsychotic, maybe like Zyprexa or Abilify, and then they're transitioning them to Envega. Patients received the first two intramuscular injections of paliperidone palmitate, 50 milligrams each, one week apart, then subsequent injections once monthly. Then it says stable patients continued into the 24 week maintenance phase. So stable patients, again, we have another limitation. So when we had eligible patients, then of those eligible patients, we found the stable patients. So already we have two big limitations here. So then they go into this 24 week maintenance phase. At maintenance phase endpoint, stabilized patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one ratio to either continue paliperidone palmitate at the same stabilized dose or begin placebo in the variable duration double blind phase. So as we read this last paragraph in here, there's a part in here that just makes me go nuts. So you take these patients, you put them on this injection after 24 weeks, so how much is that? What is that like? So seven weeks they've been on this medication, then all of a sudden you split them up and you say, okay, you're going to continue the medication and you're going on placebo. 
So the first thing that comes to my mind is you would never just abruptly stop a stabilized patient on an antipsychotic med. That is completely unethical. There's something called rebound psychosis. You might be able to take an average person who doesn't have schizophrenia, start them on one of these meds, take them off the med, and guess what? Now all of a sudden they're psychotic. It messes with the chemicals in their brain. The brain is expecting a certain amount of dopamine based on what the Invega is doing in the system. All of a sudden you rip the Invega away. What does it do to the dopamine levels? The dopamine levels shoot up. You might have rebound psychosis. So I just think this is completely unethical. In the medical world, they call it drug discontinuation syndrome. It's really just a euphemism for withdrawal from antipsychotic medication. So you can tell I'm a little passionate about this just because I think this is very, very unethical. And I, I simply don't think it's fair to those patients who were taken off of the med abruptly, assuming that's what happened. Something else that just came to my mind is that when they use the phrase placebo in a study, what really do they mean? Because a placebo should be some sort of inert substance, but until we really know what the placebo is, we can't say if it was an inert substance. There's been some studies, for instance, on vaccinations where they say they use a placebo and one is the vaccine and the other placebo is actually another vaccine with a recorded safety profile. So we don't really know what the placebo is. And I am curious to see if in this paper they mention exactly what the placebo is that they used. Anyhow, here are the results of the study. Time to relapse favored paliperidone palmitate at interim and final analysis. So again, this just floors me and it's very predictable. If you were just like, hey Nick, we're gonna take a stable group of people diagnosed with schizophrenia, we're all taking say Invega orally, and we're gonna randomize that group. One group is just going to abruptly stop their medication, the other group isn't, they aren't gonna know. Which group do you think is going to fare better? I'm going to be like, yeah, the people who are consistently taking their medication because the body's expecting that medication. Similarly, if you were to take two groups of people, start, start them on alcohol for a few months and then just stop alcohol in one group, you're going to start seeing withdrawals. So this is just, I don't know. To me, this is just bad science. Leave a comment in the section below what you think about how the study is conducted. And by the way, if you're liking this video, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe. And then they talk something about the hazard ratio. This might just be some ratio they came up with themselves. So their conclusion is this. Paliperidone palmitate significantly delayed time to relapse compared with placebo and presented no new safety signals. This is just horrible, horrible science. I mean, even these researchers who, are, who I'm sure are very intelligent people probably know that their conclusion here is just horrible. You don't take someone off their meds and then say, oh, the placebo was better than the group taking the med when the placebo group just had the med. That is not a true placebo group. So I guess the takeaway from this message is that the way that a drug is marketed is, is clearly interpreted in favor of the drug manufacturer. And when you actually go back and you really read the article, it's only then that you understand the limitations of the research that is done. And it's only then that you understand the bias in pharmaceutical research. And that is why whenever, whenever I see an article, any article that's funded by the pharmaceutical industry, you know what I do? I just automatically, poof, I throw that crap out because you just can't trust them. They have so much, there's so much bias, so much money involved that it's better to look at a non-biased article. When would I trust this article and what would change my mind? We already talked about having the three different groups. I think that would be huge. And I also think you'd have to just revamp this whole study so that you're not discontinuing a med abruptly in one of the groups. And then I also think I'd like to see this study replicated by a nonpartisan group of some sort, someone who doesn't have any sort of bias whatsoever. They just want to know what the truth is. Then, then it'd be like, okay, I'm going to believe this study. But until then, I think, I think we got to throw the study out and we just got to say, you know what? We can't believe what the study shows, nor can we necessarily believe the marketing, all the grand marketing that's around an injection like in Vegas Sustena. All right. I hope you enjoyed this video. This is kind of a newer video for me. I might continue to do kind of stuff like this and we'll see you next time. Bye.